there really is nothing like the buzz of television. Whether you're watching it or making it. As soon as that red light goes on, it's game time. He's like, oh, I want to go home now. But when things go wrong on telly, if it's live, there's no take two. Oh, my God. Calma, oh, my calma, God. Calma. Anything can happen. If it messes up, get on with it. Since the golden days of TV, calamities have unfolded live before our very eyes. Anything could go wrong. It sort of attracts danger. Say, I have no idea what's going on there, and don't try and ignore it. And over the years, the cameras have captured some truly memorable moments. <laughs> From technical shambles... ..heart-stopping accidents... Oh. This is live. We have no idea how he is. Set malfunctions... <laughs> ..bust-ups and brawls... And then all hell breaks loose. The whole nation was in double shock. You have history happening in front of your eyes. It looked like a night out in Newcastle. It was very exciting. Animal attacks. Ah! Calamitous cock-ups. No, no! It's warts and all. Whee. And unplanned audience participation. So strap yourselves in and get ready for the roller coaster ride of your life. You've got to keep going. The show must go on. Because this is when television goes horribly wrong. Back in the day, three million viewers tuned into ITV's GMTV for their fix of morning telly. And in charge of Hollywood gossip was Ross King. Now living in Los Angeles, the Scotsman mixed with the rich and famous, reporting in the LA Sun. So there Ross is, this, this boy from Glasgow. He's in Hollywood, he's living the life. And he now feeds into the programmes on ITV early morning. So you're getting all the big Hollywood celebrities. One of those celebrities was Vinnie Jones, who built his reputation as the hard man of football back in the 80s and 90s. Vinnie Jones, the hard man of Wimbledon, wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of him. When he retired from the beautiful game, he took that reputation with him to the States, quickly establishing himself as a regular on the LA scene. I've known Vinnie Jones for such a long time. He's a great pal. He is a gentle giant, but I'm always interested in the fight scenes. In one of his inserts for Breakfast TV, Ross joins Vinny for a poolside interview and gets a hard lesson from a hard man. It's very relaxed. We're at my house, we're by my pool. How long does that take and then how long actually do we see on camera? And Ross asked him about his fight technique. I think it was a fight with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I thought I'll get a little bit of an insight from a man who knows what it's like to beat up people. Well, um, I did like a three-day fight scene with him. Mm -hmm. And it'll probably show, I don't know, 45 seconds, a minute, something like that, you know what I mean? But... Then Vinny started demonstrating to Ross how it did work. You can work hard all day and then you see, like, misses, like, you know, with a camera. So, like, the camera's there and you're missing. Yeah. You know, that's a miss, whereas that is more into right, it, you right, know yeah. what I mean? Well, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> it's the whole, like, yeah, and, you know, you might go at it all day and you'll do a punch like that. There's a little bit of boxing here and a bit of that, a bit of jabbing and trying to tell Ross King how to avoid it. If I'm throwing it, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> Next minute, I am in the full suit, shirt, everything, in the pool. When he hits him and he knocks him into that pool, you see Ross go in, there's a look of horror... And there he goes, into the water. He didn't actually know whether he could swim. I mean, it, his arms and legs were all over the shop. <laughs> I knew there would be a, a little bit of kidology about the pool, but I never expected what happened. Which is underestimating Vinny, I think. You'd have been surprised if Vinny hadn't have pushed him in the pool. It was an accident waiting to happen. <laughs> oh, God! <laughs> oh, God! Grab oh. that! Get in there! Grab hold of oh. And Ross comes up thinking, I'm probably being being live now into Lorraine Kelly's studio. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, you're Vinny, you're so funny! There's two things going on there. There's your professional side, and there's the side that actually just wants to really let rip. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, Ross likes to look immaculate on camera. He spends fortunes on clothes, so to get pushed into a swimming pool, He's not pleased. At least it was my pool, but being a Scotsman, I hadn't heated it up. <laughs> oh, my God, is it cold? Oh, it's freezing! 
Oh! I did you slide. When you throw it, you're supposed to stand back like that. <laughs> <laughs> Vinnie Jones found it funny. Ross King certainly didn't. <laughs> what suit is that, Hugo? <laughs> oh, dear. Was that the Hugo? He's laughing, but he's absolutely furious. You are the funniest guy. This is great. It's only my new Hugo Boss suit. Ah, but underneath that, he is thinking, you absolute git. That suit was completely ruined. Oh, oh my God. Crazy. Jack, we my reaction oh, was, oh, my goodness me, this suit. How am I going to get dried off? Are we going to finish this shoot? And that was why I just looked like the drowned rat that I was. Like, when you throw it, you're supposed to move like that. <laughs> Obviously, your reaction is to retaliate. I'm going to get him. He's ruined my suit. I would love to get out of here and punch your lights out. But the other thing is, at the back of your head, it's Vinnie Jones. <laughs> oh, my God. You don't ever want to annoy Vinnie. So Ross does this rather pathetic, hmm, and throws some water drops on him, and I thought, oh, that's fantastic. Just take it. Take it, boy. He is the gentlest of giants, and he's a lovely guy with the biggest heart of anyone you could ever, ever meet. But never film with him by a swimming pool. Television hosts often have to put themselves into dangerous and difficult situations. The flagship show on Australia's Channel 9 network is A Current Affair. The show's stories revolve around community issues, including welfare cheats, cowboy builders, corrupt government officials and poorly run businesses. My name's Tim Avia. I'm a journalist who works for Channel 9. Over the last six years, I've worked for A Current Affair. What A Current Affair does is shine a spotlight on people who are having problems. And in this case, the landlord, David, had rented out his house to another man and he wasn't paying the money that was owed. And the man that owed that money was Stephen Jones, a man who was already known to the show and had been featured on previous exposés. I'm a pastor and I'm an evangelist. I love people. The truth is, he's a deceitful, nasty lunatic. Steve used to go around to people's houses and he'd use that religious background to con people into handing over their money. A man who stands accused of ripping off hundreds of families he just cannot be stopped. He's a man without a conscience. Stephen Jones is also a pervert. I went into a salon and to get a Brazilian wax. What? You went for a Brazilian wax? That's just thrown in there. He goes, yeah, I was going for a Brazilian. I acted inappropriately. Oh, God, it's like, oh. And the Lord said, keep it trim down there, lads. Landlord David had ticked all the right boxes and served Pastor Jones the correct paperwork to allow him to inspect his property. And he asked Tim from A Current Affair to tag along. The landlord had the clever idea of getting the TV crew to come along with him and film the meeting. But it appears Pastor Steve has already physically moved out and is living at a different address. When we got down there, the state of the house was in disrepair. There was holes in the wall. There was no one at home. It really looked like it was almost derelict. So there was a lot of boxes and things still left around the house. It seemed to be like rubbish, to be honest. It's a disaster. It's the worst possible scenario, a tenant from hell. When Steve turned up to the house, we'd been filming for a while, and when he's found a camera crew inside the house, that's when he's lost it. Hey, hey, get out. don't. You don't get a property. Don't call the cops. Mate, but call get the off. cops. Get the cops. We're here with other people. I don't care. You're out. No, See don't. Out. This man was very agitated, and I just did not want to be left outside while he was clearly running a mark. We're here with David. Yep. He's got the order. Yep. Can you explain where all the rent money's gone? None of your business. Well, it is. It's David's business. I ask him a few questions about why he hasn't paid the rent and why he's been refusing to vacate the house. Do you remove yourself from the property? Come on, Stephen. What's all the damage? I can use for the reasonable well, there's, to get off. Get, off. There holes get off the property. The pastor is clearly very dangerous and very violent. This is the moment that you think, I really wish I hadn't asked that final question. Oh, right. Call the cops, he then becomes pretty agitated and he picks up the leg of a coffee table and starts hitting the cameraman with it. You can actually hear the crack as he hits the cameraman. That is actually his watch being smashed. He's obviously 
deranged maniac. Just nuts. It's a tense standoff. Pastor Steve is unpredictable and attacking us constantly. It's at this point we're trying to back out of the house and I'm a bit worried because I don't want my cameraman to be hit. I don't want to turn my back on him because he might hit us in the back of the head. He's got the leg of a coffee table and he's not afraid to use it. Go! Go! Just the most violent person I've ever seen on television. Hey, you're Isn't he meant to walk around going, what would Jesus do? Go! Go. Maybe he's got a different Bible to the rest of us. Go. Go. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the Lord. and Don't fuck with me. Even out of the house, the violence continues. Again. Get off my property. And again. You can imagine the folk who go to his church on Sunday just thinking, no, I think I've lost a bit of confidence in you. There was a time 10 and 12 as an entry notice. I'll get you. I don't know what you're talking about. So even when we're out of the house, we're just trying to back off. Um, I've called police to alert them to this guy who is clearly going berserk. An ambulance arrives to treat our cameraman for a suspected broken hand. Luckily for him, it wasn't broken. We also wanted to make a report to the police about the violence that had been happening because he clearly assaulted a number of people. Police questioned Steve and then they released him. They were going to look into the matter further. A state apart, we also head back to our car to leave. Back it up, okay. We'd already made the decision to leave. We were packing up the car and ready to go. But this man of God continues his tirade. Steve had still been running out of the house with a power drill and yelling threats at us. And it's at this point that he gets in the car and I drives up to give us one more go. You, David, you think you're smart? Mate, you have no idea who I am. If you go and ask the D's, I'll tell you. He's yelling at us that we don't know who he really is and go and ask the D's, meaning detectives and the police. <laughs> we have an idea who you are. You're and I just told him, you're a pervert con man, that's who you are, because that's who he was. Pervert con man, aren't you? Uh, that's you. who you are. And he didn't like that at all. So when he jumps over the trailer, I'm just waiting for the big punch because he comes in with his arm outstretched, and in the end, instead of punching me, he kicks me in the shins. He's just so angry, he just can't stop. And when they ran across the road, and then they nearly got hit by that car. Cops are just there. I point out the police are still there, but he doesn't care, he just wants to get me. Good one. In the end, he did a lot more damage to himself, just tripping over himself. Popped his shoulder out. I could see that hurt him. I could see the big grazes on him. And this was all trying to fight people who weren't even fighting back. It just shows how unhinged that Steve is. He just kept on making threats. I don't give a f 60. I've had a good life. That he was going to find us, that he was going to get us. I want to see you in the street. And when I see you on the street, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. And, and the police are going, get in the car. The property. Hey, the property. The As a host, you don't expect to be attacked for doing your job. Well, go. Go. And whilst the story ultimately had a positive outcome, things had still gone horribly wrong for Tim. As for Steve... Steve is where he belongs, and that's in jail. I'm sure it won't be his last time, but it's where he belongs. Rica Famosa Latina, Rich Famous Latina, is a Spanish language show which premiered in September 2014 and followed five high-flying, financially successful Latina women in Los Angeles. Rica Famosa Latina, it's like a sort of Real Housewives vibe show. Victoria Del Rosal appeared on the show since the very first series, and Sandra Vidal joined the cast in series two. And the rivalry between the two had been bubbling over for several episodes. In one particular scene, Sandra and Victoria were supposed to be shooting a scripted feud over a dress at a fashion event in Culver City. Most of us know that producers try to engineer some situations to bring us a little bit more entertainment, you know, encourage a few things to happen to create a few fireworks. If two people are obviously fuming with each other, they'll go, ooh, let's put them in this room together and let's watch them have it out. This is going to make brilliant TV. Uh, uh, sí. <gasps> 
No te lo vas a poner. Ay, Dios. I'm just going to throw my red wine over your white dress. How do you like that? <laughs> this glass of wine was thrown over a lovely dress and <laughs> and I think they both knew that that was going to happen. Y ponte a buscar otro, mijita. Querida, vos no podés pagar esto. Vos no podés pagar esto. They wanted this to be, you know, a eruption of two girls fighting over wine in a really public place because that's what the audience of this reality show wanted to see. However, what was going to happen after that, I don't think had anything to do with the producers. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. 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 They start kicking the crap out of each other. Oh my god! Smashing glass over each other's head is oh my gosh, it's dangerous. I was completely shocked because I couldn't believe how violent it became. I mean, it's ridiculous. Some reality shows will go that little bit further with kickoffs and kind of let people fight, you know. So, which is all good and dead entertaining. This just went a little bit too far. I know Latin women are meant to be really fiery, but wow. Her whole face was cut with blood all over it and it was just madness. This is some like fucked up shit, like this is crazy. Hay que parar la isla, tiene que parar ustedes que son amigas para el la. To have a scripted fight turn into something so vicious was just beyond me. I mean, what, the poor girl walking by with blood all over her face and the other one with a horn coming out here. Like, who gained from that? And obviously they're both in so much distress. Is putting yourself under that distress worth it for people's entertainment? No. I need to have... Look at that. What do you want to do? Victoria is an assassin. I mean, that's just pushing it too far. It got to the point where it was actually, you know, one of them needed her head stitched up. I mean, that's serious, really serious stuff. Having made global news, this is a prime example of how even scripted reality can go fiercely wrong. If that's what people like, then they're barbaric, as far as I'm concerned. Despite the severe injuries, neither woman pressed charges. Talent shows take on many different flavours. From blokes leering over scantily clad ladies in paddling pools. Yeah, all right. Make some noise for contestant number one. I know I shouldn't laugh, really, but it was quite funny. To teenage school talent shows. I would be going mental at the roadie and going, why didn't you set the gear up properly? Why didn't you do this? Or even local beauty pageants. Splat! Stairs and hills don't really go together. And we love them. <laughs> Talent shows aren't just limited to primetime TV. Some are beamed across the internet to millions of viewers. The Star Banqueting Hall was the setting for Florida's annual dance hall King and Queen competition in 2016. The state's most talented dancers flock to Orlando to compete for the title. There are special acts and there are special acts. I think one of my favourites was competing in, in Florida, in Orlando, in the Dance Hall Queen dance competition. Fire Flexi is an act that you just have to see just because of the name. on the floor and she douses herself round her vaginal area. I thought it was water. I thought, where's this going? What's going on? It's not a bottle of water. Straight away, you know it's not going to end well. It's not going to end well. She proceeds to set fire to her frou-frou. It was like whoosh, and then next thing you know, she's just whacking her bits. Flames are flying out of her uh, nether regions. The tush turned into a bit of an inferno. A 
her vagina is on fire. Her denim hot pants are ablaze. She is burning, burning alive. There's a fireball in her pants. Sort of half running off, half not. She's not screaming, she's not panicking, she's kind of laughing throughout it. <laughs> Everyone's letting it happen. Audience are filming on their phone. Maybe they just didn't get what was happening. When clearly this poor woman is giving herself a self enforced Brazilian. What was she thinking? <laughs> Fireflexy's heat may not have gone according to plan, but she still managed to proceed to the dance off rounds. In true showbiz style, she comes back. You can see how burnt she is around sort of upper thigh area. You can quite clearly see she's got elastoplasts all down her legs. First degree burns. It's past anything that the body can endure. Despite the burns, Fireflexy caught the eye of the judges and triumphed over the opposition. Although it hurt, we're talking about her now, so in a way it works. I'll be all right, give me two weeks. It hurt? No, it don't hurt, it's just my thighs touching. Yeah, it just hit. It's a first degree. I'm going to go, because I got first aid, bandage it up, and let it clear out. Clean it out. I got peroxide and all that. I'll be fine. I'm, I'm hitting the Walmart, and I'm going to get my first aid together. How anyone in their right mind let her do that? Where was her mother? Who would have known when they turned up that night that they would have seen a bushfire? Talent shows across the world have given us dangerous speciality acts warning us not to try this at home, often with very good reason. Sometimes people will do literally anything to get onto um, a talent show. Stunts and things that people do that are daring or dangerous. And sometimes with um, disastrous, tragic consequences. According to the Daily Mirror, Mohammed Jalaluddin was a fan of India's Got Talent and in 2016 tried to emulate a fire stunt he had seen on the show for an audition video to try and catch the attention of the show's producers. A 19-year-old intermediate student died after he tried to attempt a deadly fire stunt on a reality television show. The really sad thing about this is that his friends were with him and they were filming him. There are people out there that try to imitate these particular stunts. The footage from this film would be sent into the TV company to act as his audition to get onto the show. The deceased Jalaluddin of Jahanuma was a fan of a reality TV show broadcast on a popular entertainment channel. We see things and we don't quite often get the boundary right as to what actually is real and what's real for, for TV's sake. We're always told you know, as an audience, do not try this at home. If you see something on Instagram or, or Facebook or, or on reality TV talent shows and it's dangerous, just don't do it. Jalaluddin poured kerosene on his T-shirt and then set it ablaze using a torch. Things turned tragic within seconds as Jalaluddin could not remove his T-shirt and the vest in time. By the time his friends put out the fire, Jalaluddin had suffered 54% burns. There are people out there that will hurt themselves in the process, um, tragically sometimes. Sadly for this young man, he was in a remote location with his friends and suffered 54% burns to his body. He was 19 years old, and, and the, the injuries and the burns that he suffered because of it were just absolutely horrendous. That was so sad, you know, how desperate that boy was to, to be famous. This guy lost his life. What, for, for reality TV to get onto a talent show? No. Hope you are having a good time watching RFOM Extraordinary Program. And we thought our reality TV was controversial. Hello, viewers. I'm Fred Wakumuma. Check out Zambia. They take it to a whole other level. Hi, Zambia. I'm Sandra, 25 years old. Ready for Marriage is one of Zambia's most popular reality shows. Hi, Africa. My name is Lea Mungombo. I'm the fourth contestant on R4M. 
It's a dating show where the contestants compete to win a luxury wedding and 45 million kwacha, about 5,500 pounds. And I need this dress on me. But there's a twist. These ladies are all current or former prostitutes and the viewers are voting for their winner. Zambia have got their own reality TV show. It's like a sort of sex worker reality TV outreach program. I don't know what to fucking say. Maybe I'm going to have to see if I can watch it on catch up. Welcome to the Ready for Marriage program. Indeed, extraordinary. You think it might be a glamorous show with lots of high production values, glamorous outfits, beautiful women and, you know, a lovely set. It does look a bit like a man is doing it in the back of his garage. There's, like, drapes in the background and they're on, like, awful chairs and the lighting's terrible. In a few minutes, we'll be totally closing the voting that you've been sending to 3322, looking at the faces of the ladies and giving them your last vote. Terrible presenter, first of all. <laughs> awful. We need to talk about that shirt. That is not a good shirt. For the starters, I'll say welcome to this elimination episode. I don't know what's more cheap, the guy's shirt or the actual set. The persons with the highest number of votes stay on the program, but the ones with the least votes, least, the lowest votes, are the ones being eliminated from the competition tonight. He's got quite a lot of used white goods behind him. I don't know if he has a side job, sort of the Zambian equivalent of Del Boy, and he's selling knockoff you know, kettles and what have you. Let's look at the ladies and see how they're looking tonight. I don't know if they are, you know, troubled or baffled or, you know, afraid. The lovely women are sitting there looking like they've just been rounded up by some kind of sheepdog. You know, they've still got their jackets on them, and I know I've got my jacket on right now, but, but they are like they're, they're like, they're like taxi. Ladies, how are you feeling? Afraid. Did you say afraid? <laughs> They're all numbered for some reason. Didn't want to bother with name tags. They thought they would just go down the number route on this one. But Alice, are you fine? Yes. Auxilia? I'm fine. You're fine? Yes. Who else is looking a bit slippy there? They're not really selling themselves very well. Obviously weren't media trained. <laughs> Sharon is looking at me the other way around. Are you here? Ready? Are we ready for elimination? Who's excited about elimination? Who wants to go back on the streets? I'll see you later. Oh, on your way back to the parking lot. We invite uh, contestant number 05, Jane Mutale. Jane, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chipala. Good evening, Joas. How are you doing? I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And you're just thinking, take your jacket off, relax, girl. Like, you know, you're number five. Like, you know, you're still in with a chance. Give a little introduction of yourself to the viewers and um, whatever details, whatever stories are there to tell about yourself. It's actually quite sad when you watch it because these poor women look very unhappy. Watching these women like, have to go through that process is daunting. Are they being taken advantage of by the show and by the presenter who is basically their pimp for the show? Mm, I'm Jane Mutale, uh, contestant number five on r 4 Um I'm happy to be on this programme, Wanda. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how they can use mis people's misfortune for viewing pleasure. Are these people being taken advantage of a little bit to a degree? And they're using them to make a TV show. Are they genuinely interested in these women or is it just for the viewers? Jane, we have a little less than 15 minutes before the voting is closed down completely. And since you're on the microphone, you can still indeed do ask for your votes and perhaps your supporters may give you the votes on 3322. Mm, viewers out there, I'm asking for your votes. I really need them because they mean a lot to me. These poor girls are pleading to camera to like pick them. I just feel so sorry for them. Around the world, different boundaries are set by reality TV programmes. Obviously here they're using prostitutes. In the UK we would never do that because they're vulnerable and you wouldn't want to exploit them. Whereas in Zambia, they didn't give two shits. If you vote for me, that means uh, you are empowering me of which I am appreciating so much. If something is there to help someone, it's coming from a good place. So you've kind of got to think, do you know what? There, there's good intentions there. I don't think you should mess around with marriage, though. I am even thanking those who are voting for me. Even those who are not, maybe they might change their minds and start voting for me. She seemed really sweet. I felt for her. As shocking as the show may be to us, it still remains one of Zambia's highest rated shows and is just about to enter its fourth series. Are you ready for marriage?
Zambia's hit reality show is back. This season of Ready for Marriage promises a chance at marriage for women looking to escape the prostitution industry. That actually makes me speechless. The show will run for 13 weeks. That's over 90 days of endless drama. That is not a nice reality TV show to watch at all for me. By the early noughties, reality TV was saturating the airwaves. Hot on the heels of the likes of Big Brother and Survivor, 2001 saw a new reality TV game show hybrid hit UK screens. Every TV exec wants to hit big with a format. Because if you hit big with a format and it goes global, you're making tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of pounds. Hi, and welcome to Touch the Truck. So it's really interesting that they came up with a format that is as dull and as uninteresting as Touch the Truck. Set in a shopping centre in Essex with Dale Winton at the helm. There you see them, 20 truck touches. Touch the trucks or 20 contestants filmed non-stop around the clock whilst they battled to stay awake, with only a brief toilet break allowed every two hours. They're not allowed to sleep, sit or slump, because if they do, our team of referees will disqualify them. It's who can touch the truck for the longest amount of time wins a not very nice Five, car. Four, three, two, one. Touch the truck. This was the purity of Big Brother, but with a twist, because you knew that all the contestants were going to end up hallucinating. So, I mean, it sounded quite exciting. Oui, je donne de Lijon. So it's about 7.49 at the end of the year. What's going on? And I remember the response of the uh, missing editor. He physically jumped out of his chair and said, that is brilliant. At 25 to 1 is Wendy Hesketh. Kay Rigby, Mary Moore and Colin Caffrey. While at 10 to 1, it's David Guest. Big Brother had just started and it was generally young, good-looking people. We just want to have it really surreal. So we had a, like a vicar, we had a homeless person, we had an astral-projecting Cornish roofer. Someone said that you were going to put yourself into a trance to keep yourself going. Later on, as, as it progresses, Dale, that's what I intend to do. Yeah, and you're a roofer, right? I'm a roofer. They should have 24-hour paint drying. That would, be, that would be almost as entertaining. I could think of something better in two seconds. Hold on. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm about to wet myself, I'm being serious. And you, you're not going to see me wet myself, I tell you now, I'll, I'll end up lamping you. One gentleman, he mistimed his toilet breaks, so he's caught desperately needing a wee and so his manager's going, just hold on, just hold on, you, you can keep it up. Where's, where's the nearest toilet to be over there? <laughs> They're all kind of twitching and stuff. I've got to go, Anna. How long is your break? Wait till you break, how long is it? I can't wait. Oh, I'll see you go. Go. Ah! And in the end he just gave up and let go of the truck and legged it to the, the bathroom. <laughs> Sounded boring, um, yes, absolutely, but it was wasn't boring just because you had people off their nuts. Sometimes they just took their hand off because they genuinely had forgotten about it and then surreptitiously they put it on. What I was really thinking was like less nuclear weapons. Hands, mate. Hands, 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 hands. Yeah. Hands. <laughs> you want a break now? No, you like chewing gum. <laughs> After 81 hours and 43 minutes, a winner was finally crowned, a day earlier than expected which revealed a gaping hole in the format. We had no idea how long it was going to last for. We started on the Sunday and then it, it finished on the Thursday, but there was meant to be a programme on the Friday, but the contest had finished, so there was no kind of show on Friday. With no show to air on the Friday, schedulers were having to source a last-minute programme to cover the whole. What they should have done, of course, is done like 10 weeks of it. Uh, no, and, uh, well, I wasn't smart enough to kind of pitch that. <laughs> The vehicle victor of Touch the Truck, the top toucher. It's Eco Warrior, Jerry Middleton! And to top it all off, they couldn't have wished for a worse winner. It's not that he couldn't drive, but. I'm told the truck's got to go. How can you part with something you've become so close to? Because I'm an environmental campaigner, Dale, so uh, I can't be driving around in massive gas guzzling vehicles, so I'm very pleased to have won it, but I will be selling it as soon as possible. The irony of the whole thing, that he was there that whole time to win this prize that he didn't really want. So why was he there? He's an eco-warrior, he doesn't want to drive around in a truck, he just wanted to sell it. It's just weird. I know you're not going to drive it, but the keys to the truck, Jerry Middleton! <laughs>
He won because he was a Rhodes protester. He'd spent weeks up trees, surviving on very little sleep. He had the perfect attributes to kind of win a contest like this. I mean, for all I know, he might still be up a tree somewhere protesting. I mean, What are you going to use the money for that you're going to get when you sell the truck? I'm going to hopefully start a new political party, announcing that in the next week and run in the next general election. Vote for me. I can touch a truck for longer than anyone else. I think you got 54 votes. I'm guessing it was mostly his extended family, possibly all the producers of the show, and maybe he paid for a couple of people for the votes. I mean, it's so dull, right? Even that story about him, bless him, is a bit dull. Trump, though, all these years later, does the reality show, makes a career out of it. He was absolutely on the right lines, just picked the wrong show. Terrible concept, terrible show. That is a classic when reality TV goes horribly wrong from the beginning. Other people might say it's boring, but I will defend my format. I mean, I, th I, th I thought it was entertaining. The format caught the attention of TV producers around the world and various international versions of Touch the Truck were made. Shit happens. One breed of TV host to gatecrash our TV screens has been the expert. Cockatiel will generally poop about once an hour. This guy is pet shop owner and animal expert Mark Marone, the Dr. Doolittle of American daytime TV. Now you've heard the expression, never work with children and animals. Here's a TV host ignoring 50% of that advice. Mark Marone, he decides to do a show where he gets not just various dogs or various cats. He gets terrapins. Fish and a monkey. Squirrels, ferrets. Puppies. You've got a bird. And I think there were rabbits at one point, all in one tiny area. It, it, it was just madness. With his menagerie of fluffy and feathered co-hosts, Mark launched the Extra Help Pet Show in 1995, which aired on cable. You're doing a niche show which is giving advice on your pet. Does it matter? Excuse me, bird. It is the most cheap looking show. He's, he's got basically a picnic table with an entire pet shop squeezed onto it. It was like Noah's Ark on a table. Let me just get the cat out of the iguana cage here. He's a sort of low budget Steve Irwin with household pets. Now I'll call from Susan. Hi, Mark. Hi, Susan. It's a simple idea for a show. Just phone in with your pet problems and Mark will advise in his own unique way. What I do is I tell him no and I poke my finger down his throat like that. He gags and then he stops. OK, now we let him do it again. We tell him no, poke your finger down the throat, he gags, and then he stops. Hello, this is Mark here. Yeah, could you just, like, I just choke it. No, it's fine, just choke your animal. What is this guy, and how did he get the job on television? I would never, never seek advice from this man. The, uh, gold nugget, whoops! <laughs> Come on, kitty. Oh, you got a cat? Just pop it in the bath. It's gonna be fine. Everything's okay. Everything is wrong with this show, but it's very compulsive viewing. And Brian is one of my... Whoops! There goes Brian. He's really well trained. It's sort of a do as I say, not as I do. It does seem incredible that people are calling in with their problems about their pets, and at the very same moment, he is surrounded by pets having real problems. Absolute chaos on a table of animals. It's just absolute madness. What was he thinking? You're not sure if they're going to fight each other, or they're going to kill each other, or they're going to start mating. There's going to be fur flying. This is obvious. You've got cats, you've got birds. Didn't he realise this? It's one of my favourite ones. They, monkeys think they taste good, too. <laughs> he's answering questions and people are being eaten. He's so calm and he's so collected. When the monkey's got the bird's head in its mouth, he's like, oh, no, I've got to separate them. <laughs> <laughs> One animal is being literally mauled to death, it seems to me, by all the others. And yet he is so unconcerned by it. <laughs> you can learn unusual things. You know, when little kids have arguments going, hey, what would happen if a dog fought a tortoise? I don't know, I'm sure the dog would win. This lovely little puppy sees a tortoise shell and he thinks, oh, it's like a Cornish pasty. I wonder what that tastes like. So he sticks his tongue in the hole. All right, so you can stop her. <laughs> <laughs> the tortoise is hiding in its shell. It's like, leave me alone, leave me alone. I just want to stay inside here. And the dog's like, you know, and he's like, ah! <laughs> Well, it will fall out on its own eventually. Whoever thought that they were all going to sit there nicely with all these cameras around them and all these lights. Yeah. And all the other nails, whoops, whoops, whoops. So his favourite word is whoops. Oh, puppy down. Kitty on the floor. Oh. You'll say, ferret down. 
hat down. Oh no, there's a parrot on the floor. Whoops. Whoops. Crash. Crash. Whoop. <laughs> we lost a monkey. All right, all right, all right. There you go, there you go. Happy, Happy monkey again. Well, I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was unbelievable, like a cross between Ace Ventura and a plate spinner. These animals are literally to escape the hell that's on that table. They're throwing themselves to their deaths. Ferret on the floor now. It's important that you really work hard in obedience to train. Oh, excuse me, Barney. Barney the dog that's on the floor. That's the brown, lovely looking dog that's on the floor that just wandering around the table, waiting for absolute carnage to kick off on the table so he can get all the, you know, leftovers. <laughs> He's like the vulture of the animals. He seems to be just waiting there for any kind of stray animal to fall off and he can catch it in his mouth. But Mark soldiers on dishing out handy tips regardless of the body count. Now this kitten never saw a dog before, so he's scared. Okay. Okay, it's the first time he's been here. It's the first time he's ever seen a dog. Let's let's go and show Barney. Now, if you hold the kitten, cut it out, Barney. The dog's out. <laughs> Come down! I'm waiting! Isn't that like the fundamental law of animals? Is that cats do not like dogs. <laughs> it's a show where I think half the cast view the other half as lunch. Cut it out, Barney. It's like a Quentin Tarantino film for cute little furry animals. Excuse me. Hey, they don't eat my bird. He is the sort of guy you want to have in a crisis because he just won't admit that there is a disaster going on all around him. While all this mayhem is going on, the phone number at the bottom of the screen is 1-800-EXT-HELP. If Mark could talk to the animals, they'd probably be screaming, HELP! He's pretending he's giving sound advice, but actually he's fulfilling all our little dreams of going, oh, could a parrot kill a monkey? Let's see, let's put them on the table together and watch them fight. <laughs>